Hi everybody and welcome. My name is Deanna O'Connor and I am a former magazine editor, current journalist and also founder of the Speak Up Club, which was originally set up to empower women in business as leaders. Um, and what I found was a lot of people, especially women, tend to turn down speaking opportunities in public because they feel like they don't feel confident enough or don't have sufficient knowledge. So this is something that actually keys into reputation management as well when we talk about online reputation management in a personal sense these days, because I think a lot of people struggle with trolling and takedowns online. So that is one element of what we will talk about today, but I'm gonna kind of lead in with a more corporate overview. Now we have um, you know, roughly half an hour and a bit of time for questions. So I have a lot of slides to get through. We're really only scratching the surface today. So I would encourage you if you'd like to hear more about any particular topic or theme to send it in your feedback. And we'll see if we can deep dive a bit further in another um, webinar some other time. But for today, we'll just have a, a kind of a brief overview of this. So we're trying to touch on personal and professional a little bit as well. This is a quote from Abraham Lincoln. I think a lot of quotes are attributed to him. God knows if they're all actually things he said, but character is like a tree and reputation is like its shadow. The shadow is what we think of it. The tree is the real thing. So a lot of what your reputation is, is like a reflection of what you are or what your business is and what you want and what, what you're ideally working and striving towards is that that reflection is an accurate reflection. So that you know, people see what is inside as such, inside you as a person or inside your business. Um, and bad communication of that can obviously not damage your reputation, but it might not portray your reputation and help you build your reputation in the right way. Some of you I know were here yesterday on our branding webinar and what we kind of built in that and looking at your values, what you want to communicate to the world is really sort of the starting point of building that reputation and then when we look at ma reputation management that is you know the next kind of step along and in a corporate sense a much broader beast <laughs> as such so your reputation really your brand is how you want to be perceived it's all those efforts you put into how you portray yourself to the world the colors the logo the tone of voice all of this but then that goes out in the world and really your control over it is, is lessened and so much less, so much more so today, because in the past, the way companies communicated with the world was sort of big advertising. It was TV, it was billboards. It was this communication outwards. But the people didn't really get to communicate back to the company. And nowadays, there's so much communication online on social media that really the the conversation has changed and so it's not just this big company communicating outwards that company has to listen to a lot of people communicating back to it as well so reputation management has really you know come into its own these days because i think on a lot of what we could drill down to in a separate webinar would be online reputation management specifically because that's really where it's at today but your reputation is how you're perceived it's what people think of you so that can be you know as we said yesterday, it was like someone could have a reputation as a gossip or someone could have a reputation as a great hairdresser. And like they just tell other people, oh, you know, they're great or watch out what you say to them. They'll like spill all your secrets. So, you know, from a very basic level, we all have a reputation and it's what other people think of us. And reputation management is really how we can affect what that reputation is. So for a, a corporate level, what reputation really the cornerstones of it are, are performance, behavior, and communication. So performance can be actually, you know, how the company does, how their stocks are doing, what, you know, what interests they are to investors, what their balance sheet is showing, their behavior, it could be to do with corporate social responsibility, how they deal with their community, their stakeholders, their employees. And then communication is how they let the world know about that and how they interact with those stakeholders as well. So corporate reputation management really does take in a lot of all of these different things that you might not think about at first. And it is a lot to do with stakeholder relationships as well. And not forgetting really importantly that these days, especially when there's such a war for talent on in companies and you know, attracting and retaining employees is one of the top you know, number one things on any company's list 
of what their concerns about because there is such a war for the, I think the right talent keeping them and, and getting them in the first place and recruitment's an expensive process so communicating internally with employees and making sure that employees are on board with the company is really super important as well you know and even if you're a small business that's something to start thinking about early on um reputation is called an intangible asset and management of it does involve sort of measuring and auditing but how how you measure and audit something that is intangible is difficult and there are there are formulas for it and i can point you in the direction of some further reading if you'd like for that to really really deep dive into it but it has been shown to have benefits. The benefits of a good reputation, I mean, even on a personal level, are obvious. You know, you'll get more business. People trust you. If you want to get employees, if people know that you're a good place to work or a nice person to work with. You know, people will want to work with you. If your products have a good reputation or your service has a good reputation, you can charge more than someone who has a bad reputation. Um, and also, as you'll become known as an expert or a leader in your field, then you'll be kind of the go-to person if the press or media want a spokesperson, because obviously you'll be known for being expert in your field. So all of these benefits of a good reputation really do have a value. And in, in larger corporate world, there are formulas to actually work this out. And there are indexes of reputation and lots of companies would be very concerned about getting to the top of these indexes as well. So, and I think Fortune magazine in particular was one where you know big companies would be very interested in being on, on that list. So, but all of these things apply to a person just as much as to a major corporation. So in terms of big companies, you can see this reputation dividend report indicated that the reputation of some of these companies really does contribute to their market cap and, and you know, in terms of the stock market, especially reputation management can be so important in terms of rumors that are circulating that can affect share prices, things in the news. If the chair of a company is, you know, borrowing millions off the company and spending it on a lavish lifestyle, that can affect their share price that like they might need to oust that chair off the board if they're going to, into a merger or an acquisition situation. So really everyone, you know, working in a sort of very transparent way and working towards the goals of the company that is so important in reputation management and i think that that kind of behavior that we just talked about in terms of maybe a chair who's a bit lavish with their lifestyle um isn't really acceptable in the global build business world anymore and i mean you just have to look at say the fai recently and john delaney to see how you know that is just creates a huge scandal and it's a behavior that you know is kind of madman era but it's it doesn't wash these days so how do you manage reputation what you do managing reputation is managing the components of it so a lot of people when they hear the phrase reputation management they might think in terms of like crisis management and you know like a, an oil company with an oil spill they have to get a good message out there in the media they have to hire a consultant and communications company to say the right things to help them clean up the mess essentially but really reputation management goes way further back than that because it's not just about glossing over your inadequacies which i think is something that we sometimes think it it is it's that kind of smoothing over a crisis but really it has to go back further than that and if you get to the point of a crisis of reputation the, the best thing you can do is take that and learn from it and if, if you're getting trolled on social media the best thing you can do is ignore the trolls but really see if there are any genuine comments about your product or your service or your business and see if you can learn from them because if you're getting customer service kind of feedback then listen to it and engage with it and it's a learning experience that will improve your reputation. Whereas if you ignore it or don't care about it, that will absolutely trash your reputation. So a good reputation is based on being good, <laughs> performing well, behaving well, communicating well, and having values. And you know those values that we talked about yesterday and anyone who wasn't there yesterday, if they do want to look back, Iconic will be putting that um, personal branding um, and developing your USP webinar up on YouTube. So you, you can check back in on it. And it does apply to business as well as personal. Um, so all these components of reputation are so important because you have to really deep dive into the values of your company. And 
you know, if you're not a big business, if you don't have a communication manager or a reputation manager or a PR company on speed dial, then what I think would be really good for you to do is to really workshop this. Maybe it's a case of getting someone in for a day who will workshop it with you. Maybe it's a case of taking these slides and really, you know, going through them, doing some further reading and thinking about how you want to build your reputation, because there's no point kind of reacting to reputation management. It's a proactive thing. It's building that reputation. It's making it strong. And it truly, truly really is about living your values. So once you have done the work on thinking about your company or personal values, it is building it slowly every day and every way and everything you do, um, underlining that and working towards building your reputation. It's not something that just magically appears out of nowhere. You have to, you have to earn it. So the intrinsic identity of an organization, what the organization stands for is those values that we talked about. And then your performance and behavior in the company should really align with those values. And then your communication, if you really live by your values, what you communicate out should ring true to people, should feel authentic to people. I hate that word, it's been overused, but it is the kind of the only word to use in this, in this sense. So really, living the values of the company is key to building your reputation and then kind of everything else builds from that and I can't I've stayed on this slide a long time but I cannot stress that enough so then the other thing you can manage is your relationship with your stakeholders and as I mentioned this is the community you operate in so a lot of companies would be very deeply involved in CSR and sustainable business practices and you know, even on a small scale, that is something a small company can do. I've done a lot of work with Chambers Ireland on what was called the CSR Awards and is now called the Sustainable Business Impact Awards. And even though there are huge companies involved in you know applying and being nominated for those awards, also smaller companies have been involved. And it's very important to pick things to do that resonate with your brand and resonate with your values. So just going, oh my God, we need to do something for charity quick, just do something, it doesn't work. You have to do something that, you know, you have the skill set to do something meaningful. You have the, the people who want to work in their local community, make a difference to something that's connected to you. And that really resonates in a much deeper way. So stakeholders also employees, hugely important on how you communicate with your employees. And, you know, a reputation as a good person to work with or a good place to work is based on everyday kindness and small things that build up. So. You know, it's not just a huge bonus at the end of the year. It's being, do you need to take a morning off to go to the dentist? Do you know, have you had a death in the family? Do you need some grieving time? It's being nice about things, being a good place to work, being a compassionate employer. So all of those things build towards your reputation. And it's so global and so many, so many parts to do with it that we'll have to move on because we can't keep going deep diving into that. But again, just to kind of go over that identity thing, it is really figuring out who you are or what your company is that, you know, is so key to getting this reputation building going. So your corporate character, your unique purpose, beliefs, mission, values, that's all of your company culture. So once you understand that and really, really, really spending a day workshopping or half a day workshopping it even to just get those keywords of your corporate values, get that mission statement, get all of that kind of defined. And then once you have it, it's communicating it to your employees so that every employee in your company is an advocate for it and they align with it and they understand what your corporate culture is. Because if you don't have one, they can't understand it and they can't, you know, hook into it and engage with it and use it in their daily work as well. And I think it, it's very obvious if people don't feel engaged in their job or with the culture. So they can't engage if there isn't a culture. So you, you do need to kind of have a little think about that, even if you're only a small company. And then once you have that corporate culture and values all thought about, it's next that will feed into your content and communication strategy. So even something as simple as your Instagram account or your Twitter account or writing a press release, you know, everything should align and everything should really clearly set out what you are, why you are, what you do and keep building those blocks to keep your reputation growing in the like particular focused way that you have planned. Um, Gary Sheffer, who used to be the chief communications officer at GE and is now a professor in Boston University, 
just said this and it's so true it's like digital technologies have democratized thought leadership and reputation and it gives millions of people a voice in your reputation so everything is so globalized that you know one tweet could go viral and completely change your world that could be in a good way or a bad way but literally once you are out in the world and out in public everybody has the chance to weigh in in what on what they think of you so it is really important to communicate with anyone who does from the outside world communicate with your company and think about how you get back to them you know a lot of companies <clears throat> would have a, a policy in place that in terms of dealing with the press that their communications officers have to get back to the press you know 90 percent of press calls within one hour for instance and especially if there is a breaking story or something that is happening that is so important we'll come back to that later but it is so important to have a strategy around communication and think about how you get back to people who are communicating with your company or yourself. <laughs> so kind of a comprehensive overview, overview of reputation management would be to have a long-term strategy in place. So that is how you're building your reputation over the long term. It's not short term. Your reputation is for life. Um, you know, how can you measure it? How can you audit it? How can you manage it? Um, now, for, for kind of personal people and um, small business, measurement and audit is probably a bigger thing than you can really take on. But you can certainly, you know, just keep an eye on what, what feedback you're getting from the outside world, what feedback you're getting on social media, and just make sure that what you're putting out there and what how you're dealing with people does align with your values, your intrinsic identity, and this external image that you're putting out there. Because sometimes if you don't have a, a focused approach to it you're what you think you are and what other people think you are there can be a gap so making sure that those two are coming closer together is really where you want to be at in your reputation management the criteria that are measured and audited if you are going there <laughs> these are they and even on a smaller scale you can take a look at this and see you know kind of rate these well in my personal business my small business, how do I score on these and how much do I communicate these to the outside world? So, you know, are you actually working on them? Are they where you want them to be? And then are you actually getting some information about that out through your media, social media channel, channels or your communication with employees or whatever way it needs to be communicated? So you can see here things like innovation, employee talent, financial performance, social responsibility, governance, integrity, all of these things are things that companies are measured on for their um, reputation. Sorry, I'm gonna to have to wipe my nose here because I'm in a cold room. Um, uh, excuse me. <clears throat> so these are kind of the criteria that build your reputation and being aware of them is important so that you know that you are paying sufficient attention to each of them. And this isn't just an exercise in optics this is an exercise in how well your company is run because all of these things are important to the daily running of your company. So this isn't just about the image you want to portray. It is about really the, the core of how, how you're doing business. So reputation management can really affect change in an organization once they start to take it seriously. I mean, if you just look at any of the financial scandals like Enron, Arthur Anderson, these were companies that moved away from their original values of, you know, Arthur Anderson, the Arthur Anderson himself who set up the company was very dedicated to very transparent accounting. All of a sudden, you know, all of these financial crises happened. People moved away from being transparent and accurate into being a little bit shady. And all of a sudden these companies' reputations were in tatters and rightly so because they, they deserved to be at that point. And they were, you know, in smithereens, that was the end of them. So reputation management isn't just optics. It is hugely, hugely important because it brings you back to the key values of your company. It, it is, holds you accountable to are you doing business well? And it makes you take a look at that. And really that, you know, is so key. And especially today in a world where, you know, everything is is find outable and transmittable and shared over social media so quickly that you can be held to account very quickly and there's there's really nowhere to hide so 
in a comprehensive reputation management plan. This is sort of the, the circle of how it goes, the assessment, the audit, the gap analysis, seeing where you need to do some more work on things. You look at your reputation, you look at the criteria and you look at what you're aspiring to, and then you put a plan in place, look at all the problems you have, try and fix them. Because if you if a reputation management plan highlights problems in your company, if you don't want to get a bad reputation for those problems, then you need to go back and fix those problems. So doing a reputation management audit can be very, very helpful because it is basically an audit of everything you do. Holds you accountable, makes you think about it. And also then the, the, the last piece in the puzzle is how you communicate that to the outside world and how you communicate with your stakeholders and engage with them. And then every so often you go back around and you do it all over again. So <laughs> there is a, a metaphor which I thought was quite entertaining in reputation management, and it comes from Dr. Doolittle, if anybody remembers that book or movie, but it's about this nutty professor who finds this island with all these um, unusual animals on it. And this guy is called the push me pull you, and it's a two headed llama. And the metaphor it is in reputation management is the push me pull you metaphor means that you can have, you know, the, the CEO of a company looking this way and the communication people looking this way. So the CEO is just, I'm gonna do this and I'm working this way. And they're trying to put out this message that we're working in a very responsible manner, everything's good, but they're going in different directions. And what you can't do is go in different directions. What the company aspires to be and the company, the, the reputation that you aspire to have, what you're actually doing needs to be going in the same direction as that because reputation management and communication, even the best PR company in the world can't keep continually glossing over poor behavior in a company and poor or lack of values or moving away from their values. So really your reputation management should get both of those heads looking in the same direction. And what you really need to be careful of in a, in a bigger company, and I know probably most of you this might not be as um, relevant to, but organizational myopia, which is a short-term focus. So, you know, short-term focus is let's drill for oil and forget about the environment kind of thing <laughs> is uh, myopic, um, a very simple example of it. Or so you have to think about being more sustainable. You have to think about the long-term, you have to think about, you know, we might have a reputation as an amazing oil company for 10 years and then the world like is on in flames <laughs> and nobody likes us anymore. So, you know, it's about doing your business in a better way so that you can have a sustainable business that will last for longer. Leadership hubris and arrogance or feeling of invincibility. I think our friend Trump is a great example of that. You know, a communication professional or a PR company or a consultant can only do so much if the leadership in a company isn't listening to them a reputation manager can only do so much if the company isn't or the leader of the company doesn't believe in it so you know if you look at trump he won't be told he won't be um led into being a little bit more um media friendly at all he just you know he just does what he wants so if you have a leader in a company who just feels they're invincible doesn't need to care about customers doesn't need to care about stakeholders um that's a real problem because they're not going to work on actually the long-term view of the company, the long-term sustainable business for that company. Um, and you do need to really, everyone needs to be on board with this. You need to back up what you say. So, you know, you can see here, my favorite word, authenticity again, and reputation, the, the more authentic and the, the less bullshitty you are. If you really, you know, walk the walk, your reputation will grow stronger, but people can smell BS a mile away and people and journalists are all too keen to sniff out any wrongdoing because that's a story, but it's also, you know, there's there's something bad going on, obviously, if something isn't ringing true. So you really have to, to be authentic and to to back up everything you're saying when you're, when you're going to the media with something. Um, in terms of media relations, you know, bigger companies will put a lot of effort into this obviously but even as a smaller company or a, a solo entrepreneur you can still um very easily kind of work on developing media relations and you know even as a, a one-man band kind of business you can follow people who will be relevant to what you do on twitter or instagram you can engage with them on social media you know um you can send them press releases or whatever 
and try and get, get a relationship going because once you have a good relationship with media then they're more willing to to listen to what you have to say and speaking as a you know ex-magazine editor myself I would have had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails every day but obviously if I know someone and I know that they have good stories or good things to cover or have a good relationship with them I'm going to open their email first so developing relationships with media is still important um or influencers if that's if that's your bag these days um and a good way to do it is you know in when you have a good story when they want an interview not to shy away from it to grant them access so then that you have a relationship built up you can also send out press releases you can offer expert comment on things or you could pitch an angle so one thing to note and this is maybe a, a topic for a, a different webinar on how to pitch to the media um is that if you are pitching something to a journalist we don't want to hear i want to tell you all about my company and why my company is great because that's an ad for your company so if you're trying to develop media relations what you need to do is pitch an angle you need to pitch a reaction to something that's happening in the world or a thought leadership on a topic that's trending but don't hard sell buy my product buy my product don't sell yourself sell or pitch ideas about things and that is a, a good way to build up a relationship with the media and to be you know the person they'll call for comment or to be on that radio program or to have an opinion on something because you're an expert or a leader in your field not because you're going to go on that radio program and try and sell your product being an expert is enough to cement your reputation in people's minds and make you the go-to person or the go-to service or the go-to product when they want to buy your product but trying to hard sell it in the wrong place or time is going to just have the the reverse effect and you won't be called back again so um, there are some times in a crisis where no comment might be the best possible thing to do. Um, you know, there are certain times and certainly in corporate world, uh, things can be very sensitive around mergers and acquisitions, takeovers, all of these times. If a particularly high profile executive has is perhaps going to hand in their resignation is one incidence where it can be a little bit tricky because say this executive is going to hand in their reg resignation on a Wednesday and a journalist asked asks on a Monday have they resigned and at that point they haven't but by the time the story comes out they might have so it's a kind of a you know you don't want to be seen to be denying something that might be true in a few days kind of situation and that can be tricky so at, at certain times it is best to trot out a, as a matter of policy we don't comment on rumors kind of line um, and there are certain things that you just you know press doesn't have a right to know everything about your business there's certain sensitive information there is GDPR there is proprietary information about copyright, uh, personal information about employees, personal lives, information that isn't fully developed, um, anything that might threaten your security in any way. So there are certain times when it's okay to not have a comment, but that being said, in terms of crisis management, which I think is what we are moving on to next, well, in a couple of seconds, in terms of crisis management, I would have to say that timing is crucial and commenting is crucial and we're going to get back to that in a couple of slides but just want to finish off on see how you're doing for time here um finishing off just on how you tell your story um and content development so basically when i was talking about pitching to the press there um it is a great idea to try and you know develop content yourself as a business or as a, a solo entrepreneur Tell your own story because you have an opportunity to use social media, LinkedIn, post blogs on LinkedIn, if that's, you know, the professional arena that is going to work for you. Um, offer your, your expertise as a thought leader, offer to write, you know, columns about subjects, but not about my business is great and I'm great. Um, write it about a topic that you have some expertise in give a webinar about a topic you have some expertise in, approach Iconic and offer, <laughs> offer to do a webinar for them. Um, get, you know, get in contact with your audiences, get feedback from them, and then you know, try and put yourself out there to, to get those relationships going. Um, one thing I, I would kind of think very carefully about is sponsored content and trust, because 
what is happening in the media today is it used to be very much articles and advertising but now a lot of sponsored content is happening which is it looks like an article but it's actually paid for and that's fine but again if you just try and hard sell in sponsored content it's not interesting nobody cares so if you're going to go down the sponsored content road for your reputation i would say that you will have a better reputation if you again sponsor content that is a topic of interest that you have expertise in that the audience will get value from what are they going to walk away and go i really learned something there that was great i'm glad i read that as or i'm glad i went to that webinar because if you just give them the hard sell they're not getting anything from it and they're they're going to skip over that page or you know so if you are going down that road it is valuable if it's done well but unfortunately sometimes it's not done well and then it's burning money um if you have a spokesperson in your organization or you are the spokesperson in your organization who is going to be kind of taking the tough questions um and like the picture I have on this slide is someone, you know, with multiple microphones in front of them now in our everyday lives, we're not used to that. And standing in front of a load of press, shoving microphones in your face is not something that is going to be easy if you've never encountered it before. So media training is very important if you are going to be a spokesperson and if you think you might be facing some sticky questions. <laughs> but even if you're not facing sticky questions for any kind of, and that like, this is what I do for, I like have seen it work you know, practice interviews, videoing and reviewing it, working on verbal, verbal leaks and ticks or physical leaks and ticks. So, you know, if you always kind of stand with your arms crossed when you're talking, you might seem a little bit defensive, but you might notice that until you watch yourself in a video doing it, practicing the tough questions because guaranteed you might think you're able to cope with them, but can you cope with them when you're like surrounded by six reporters and a, and a camera and loads of people holding microphones in your face? And also practicing the tough questions means that you'll find the ones you can't answer and then you'll figure out how to answer them. So rehearsing kind of this stuff is so important. Um, and I do think that timing is hugely important as well. Um, social media just is, you know, you can really use it to your advantage, but it can also be a disadvantage. So customers have more means to connect. That's great. But you need time to go and find them where they're commenting so you know if you used to have a form on your con on contact form on your website and now you've got a contact form on your website you've got twitter you've instagram dms you've linkedin messages and they're coming at you from all angles you have to collate them and make sure you deal with them all especially on social media complaints are visible before complaints used to be written on note paper and sent to the complaints department and whoever opened it read it and probably threw it in the bin afterwards and they were the only person that saw it, not even other people in the company saw it. But now other employees can see complaints. So it's, you know, it's your reputation as a good place to work might not be so good if everyone can see there's loads of complaints. I mean, right now, AIR are going through a massive crisis and does it make you want to go and work for AIR? Probably not. So they're, they're struggling to recruit and they're struggling to manage this, this really bad reputation crisis that they're having at the moment. Um, and people are complaining on social media because we've learned, we've all learned, and I've done it myself, that I've sent an email. No one's replied to the email. I've sent another email. I've tried to go on the phone, but there was an hour wait. I'm going to go on Twitter and complain because when people can see that I'm complaining, they're going to take my complaint more seriously. And I hate doing anything negative on social media, but I think we've all got to the point with making a complaint and not being heard that the only avenue left sometimes is to really visibly publicly complain. So unfortunately, that is something that happens and customers and consumers have got to know that, you know, and some people will use it as a first resort. I'd only use it as a very last resort, but customers and consumers have got to know that this is how you get people to pay attention to your complaint. And that information is shared at speed and it can be visible forever unless, you know, you can get them to take it down, which they probably won't if they're not happy. Um, on the, like there are positives too, it builds community. So you can use social media to your advantage to build your reputation. Building community in any way you can around what you do is really important. It is a customer service channel and it can be a really effective one. And dealing well with people over social media can make them feel like it's a very easy, quick way to get in touch with you. They're happy that they're you know instantly able to talk to someone. They kind of, and, and it's someone real. And again, you can use social media for influencer marketing, which 
if done well, and there's a lot, a lot of cases where it's not, but if done well, can indeed, you know, build your reputation as well through that. So um, there's, it's just a quick little fly through on really how to assess how to respond on social media. So there are various different people you might meet on social media. There are trolls who are just bashing anyone and everything. Ragers who are having a rant and rave about something, they might have a genuine complaint. Misguided people who just have the wrong information and need that information corrected probably because they're gonna spread that wrong information. And then you have your really genuine unhappy customer who has had a negative experience. So as you can see here, I would go from the monitor, respond, rectify kind of downwards. So trolls and ragers probably best left alone and not engaged with because it's only giving them oxygen. Um, there are instances where that can work, you know, engaging actually can work. And <laughs> funny enough, I was listening to a podcast with the comedian Joanne McNally the other day um, and Moira O'Connell, the TV presenter. And I think it was Joanne who said that she had got an Instagram DM that was really negative and trolly. And she doesn't normally engage with them, but she did reply to them. And once that person got her reply, they actually sent her a really positive fangirly message back saying, oh my God, I didn't think you like reply to your DMs and talk to me and I think you're great. So actually sometimes showing that there's a human there that it, it can neutralize that negativity because people who are hiding behind a, a computer screen trolling don't get that human, like they're, they're just not thinking about it in real world terms and they're not thinking that there's a real person at the end of it. But I mean, with a, if you're trolling a big company, I think you're, it's probably less likely, but if you're trolling a single person and you realize that they're a human being, you might stop trolling, but that can, that can go either way. So in general, if you're a, a corporate, I think trolling should be monitored, but probably monitored in terms of, is there anything real that we can work on that is being complained about here, but you can't respond. Whereas as the complaint becomes more real, then you respond, then you work on it, then you do things to rectify it. So depending on what the, the feedback is, that would be how you respond. And also use it to your advantage. Like even if you're only monitoring and not responding, listen and learn, because what people are complaining about is what is wrong with your company. So Dell Hell was one of the brilliant examples. I love that. <laughs> that um, there's a guy called Jeff Jarvis and he wrote on his blog, Dell lies, Dell sucks because he had had a terrible experience with Dell computers. He was really unhappy with them. And this went, you know, it blew up and lots of people got, ba got back to him about things that had happened with their computers and it really spiraled and became a huge thing. And that, that's why Dell were going through Dell hell with this. But within a couple of months, or actually it was two years, I think maybe, or two months, I think it was two years, he wrote an article, yeah, I think it was two years later, in Business Week magazine, I think. And so, and the, this article was called Dell Learned to Listen. So based on what he wrote and other people's response to it, the company really did listen, really fixed all of the problems to the point where this guy was like, turned around and wrote another article saying, well done them. They've actually reacted really well, responded really well to this. And that's like a perfect case of good reputation management where you're listening to your detractors, you're taking on board what you're say they're saying and you're fixing it. Um, if you are monitoring like what people are saying, you can do a few things to, to do that. You can create Google alerts for terms relevant to you. You can set up an RSS reader. If you, um, on, a, on a bigger scale, you can subscribe to a media monitoring service, which will you know, give you kind of monitor all of the press mentions of you and give you reports on that. And then just on a personal level, you can just check your social media, check the reach, the impressions, engagement, maybe keep a little tally of it on an Excel spread spreadsheet um, and keep a tally of complaints if there are any so that you're kind of aware of things are getting worse um, and how you've reacted and responded and have you had like happy customers with your response. Um, just crisis communication, one last thing on that, I mean, the, the speed of response is vital. As I said, no comment is better than an ill-prepped spokesperson, but silence can be construed as guilt. And I think um, Minister McEntee, Helen McEntee has had a, you know, a, a tough week with this because she hasn't wanted to answer questions on Seamus Wolfe's appointment as a judge. And it's really landed her in hot water. So the, the, would it have been better to just go straight in and, and do the question and answer session sooner rather than later, if you're gonna have to do it anyway? 
it leaving things kind of stew gets gives people more time to be angry about it leaves the, the conversation stewing as well until you've dealt with it so stepping in fast and nipping it in the bud is sometimes the best thing to do um some of you might have seen caroline lennon the ceo of air on prime time the other night um a lot of huge problems with air's customer service have been happening so she went on prime time to address that directly herself and really the ceo is the person who needs to step up because and put their neck on the block and she did that fair play to her now um i think they're good and bad about what she did definitely but it is important that she did did that and i think that you know there's so much anger towards air at the moment and I thought that her explanation was reasonable. I mean, bad management, I think, but she did very honestly tell internally what had happened in the company, the strategy they were pursuing, how it seems to have massively backfired. Um, but I have to say fair play to her for going on and doing it. So speed of response is vital. First mover advantage. The first person who says the thing is the person people are probably going to believe, you know? So if that thing is a rumor, then you need to get in there and nip it in the bud straight away. Um, I'm very conscious that I'm running a little bit over, so I am just going to maybe skip very quickly through the slide. But in terms of what you are saying in crisis management, sometimes it's good to step outside what you think you should reply and think in a broader sense of what is the appropriate response of a responsible organization? What is the like what can people legitimately expect and what would they want to hear? So, you know, you might have what you want to say because you're trying to cover up some things or you don't want to admit some things, but you genuinely have to go, what is the, what is the, what would the responsible person step up and say? What would the person who has been very transparent step up and say? And then uncomfortable as it is sometimes, you need to step up and say that because you might not admit to yourself that you need to say it unless you benchmark against what the best practice would be. Um, and really one thing to kind of think about is people will forgive bad things happening, but they won't forgive you for not caring that a bad thing happened. And another great quote um, in terms of reputation management, I think it was Warren Buffett who said, I don't care if you make a business decision that loses me money, I, I'll forgive that. But what I won't forgive is if you make a business decision that loses me reputation. And that is really important to remember. There's just crucial points in taking control of narrative. If there's a rumor, if there's a story breaking, 45 minutes is where it's on Twitter. Journalists are starting to get hold of it if they've been, if they've been going through Twitter. Um, then there's like the six hours where it's kind of breaking. It'll probably be on news websites. Three days is where the print press will have got hold of it. Once they didn't get it on the first day, we'll have it on the second day. And then two weeks is kind of like if you haven't dealt with it, when it's going to come back and there'll be like follow up stories on it. So those are crucial points where you really need to kind of get in and take control of the narrative on a story or a crisis. And in summary, I would say that reputation management is all about being good, you know, living by those values and then making sure you communicate those values. So it's not about glossing over bad behavior. It's about really looking back into your company, working on your values, building good behavior and building a reputation for it and how, then telling people about that. So sorry if I've run over time, but again, here's my website, speakupclub.ie. If you wanna go on there, you'll find all my links to social media or email address to email me out if you have any questions you wanna ask or you want any further consulting or coaching on the matter, can do that over Zoom at the moment. So, so thank you very much for attending today and I will hopefully talk to you all soon. Bye.